So I'm going to read something that Nietzsche wrote in the first part of Beyond Good and Evil, which is a section called Prejudices of Philosophers. And it's a really good example of the density of this book. One of the ways of conceptualizing Beyond Good and Evil, and I think this is true for most great works, of, it's true for most great works, is that unconsciously collects patterns from his or her interaction with the world and then gives them initial formulation and the patterns can be deep and multi-level the initial formulation translates them into not so much ideas as into the seeds of future ideas author happens to be, the more the case that his or her writings contain within it the seeds of future ideas. And the, the romantic philosophers or authors, so I think Nietzsche and Dostoevsky are, in some sense, foremost among them are particularly notable for their ability to do exactly that. Now, in this particular paragraph, this particular paragraph not only serves as an example of that, but it also serves as a self-conscious reflection on that because Nietzsche is writing a paragraph here that is full of the seeds of, of ideas that will actually bloom and flower to a great degree in the 20th century. But while he's simultaneously repeating this, those ideas, he's also telling you exactly how he's doing it and how it is that philosophers do it. So it's a, it's a spectacular approach. I'm going to read it probably phrase by phrase and then take it apart because it's so dense and Beyond Good and Evil is like that. It's Nietzsche, when Nietzsche was writing Beyond Good and Evil, he wasn't very well. And because of that, he had to spend a lot of time thinking and not very much time writing. And because he was also brilliant beyond comprehension, his ability to distill what he was thinking into incredibly rich phrases is, I, I think in some sense, it's beyond parallel. I mean, often if I'm reading a book, if it has any utility at all, I'll mark it. Usually I hold over the top of the page or sometimes put a yellow sticky note on it if I find a place where there's an idea that's worth returning to that's, uh, that's particularly worth understanding. And you can't do that with a book like Beyond Good and Evil because what ends up happening is you have to mark every sentence. And obviously marking it every sentence isn't any better than not marking any sentences at all. So, I guess I also want to tell you why it is very important to do it in this book. It's a very difficult book. It's also the sort of book that can rattle you up. So, each of you is very interesting. They're active and they're each pursuing their individual desires, but at some point they may choose to organize themselves into a game. And if they organize themselves into a game, what they're doing for all intents and purposes is producing a little society, a little micro society. Within that micro society, they're deciding what desires will be currently expressed and how they'll exist in relationship to one another. And that means that they can cooperate without too much conflict. 
jointly move towards uh, a joint aim without and, and, and gather all the benefits that might be associated with that. That might be an option for the aim, whatever it is, but also might not just be a joint that's to be had in pursuit of that activity. Now, people do that socially because we have to do that in our people because our desires have to be melded with those of other people. But we also do it psychologically and those two things exist in a dance because as a future of other people the demands of the fact that we are they require each of us to arrange our desires in a way that's acceptable to everyone else. But at the same time what we do that the process by which those desires are born, and then we internalize that process and use that for our desires. And this sort is of a constant mutually informed dance between the important group. The culmination of that is the society and the society. And it's that process that we choose all the these characters. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what's the utility of articulating such things and conceptualizing them and understanding them? And the answer, in some ways, is straightforward. If you don't want to run afoul of your own desires, you have to organize them. Because some of them are short-term and some of them are medium-term and some of them are long-term. And some of them aim at this and some of them aim at that. And it isn't necessarily the case that those desires allow for mutual fulfillment. So for example, maybe you're very interested in pursuing a sexual relationship with someone, but you're also very interested in having a family and some stability in your life. Or maybe you're interested in pursuing a sexual relationship with a whole sequence of people, but you're also interested in having a family and stabilizing your life. It's not obvious that those desires can exist in the same universe without producing what you might think about as war, and some of that might be a psychological war, but some of it's also going to be a war that actually occurs in existence while you're fighting through the contradictory consequences of wanting to pursue many people and forming a stable relationship with one person. Now, part of the reason that you want to think about these sorts of things is because if you think about them and get your thoughts and your value system intelligently and coherently and cogently laid out, then when you act out that value system in the world, you're going to run into less conflict and less uncertainty and less misery, and you're going to have a higher probability of getting what it is that you want, but you're also going to have a higher probability of getting what you want in a way that allows you to cooperate with other people without entering into too much conflict with them. And so in some sense, the purpose that you think, the reason that you think, or the purpose of thinking, is so that you can sort out how you're going to move forward in the world without having to directly run headlong into all the obstacles that you might run into if you were doing such a thing blindly. And so then you might ask yourself, well, why would you bother reading philosophy? philosophy written by someone who's great and the answer to that is, is that they can help you think these things through in a manner that you would not be capable of doing on your own you know because Nietzsche I mean it's, it's difficult to estimate how intelligent Nietzsche was but I suspect he was perhaps one in a billion which would put him far beyond the 99.999th percentile and there's a massive difference between the ability of people to think as you move farther and farther out into the extremes of intelligence. And when you have the writings of someone who's one in a billion, then you can interact with those writings in a way that enables you, if you'll put the time in, to benefit from the spectacular fact of that intelligence. Nietzsche was a full professor by the time he was 20. At the time, he didn't even have to write his dissertation. They just made him a full professor at a time where that was that never happened.